this morning. Good saying. You know, I wanted to bring give you an update. I haven't told you about my birds lately. Boy, this is birding time, I'll tell you for sure. Uh, we had, I, I seen my first kingbird of the season this morning, so uh, anyway, that was, a, that was a treasure. They're one of my favorite birds, you know, kingbirds. And uh, we've had, we've got some bird feeders setting up outside the windows there so we can kind of watch them. We've got the biggest hogs coming up to that bird feeder that I ever saw. We've got a whole slug of cowbirds. We never had cowbirds up there before this year, I don't think, but I mean, they have moved in and took over and they can, they can eat up a, a gallon of bird seed quicker than anything I ever saw. So, and then also we've got a bunch of grackles. First time we've had grackles, purple grackles. And uh, so anyway, that's been a treat for us. And then we've got a mama, we got a mama killed him. That's fixing to give, give a hatch to a bunch of little babies. Boy, I mean, she's fussy. And, and she's right out, you know, they, them killed here, they nest in some of the oddest places. They're right out on the gravel. They love to, they love to nest in the gravel. I don't know why. It's got to be uncomfortable, you think. But, I mean, that old gal sits on them things, and through the storm, through the rain, it don't matter. She's there in the hottest day, and she just stays right there. And, boy, if you get close to her, she gives you a going over. And, uh, and anyway, I just wanted to pass all that info over to you. And uh, so that's the bird update for the month. I won't say it anymore. This month. Number, Barb says we're going to do number 61. We're going to do the first and last verse because we got we got a lot of work to do. Here.
so we can lean on him. All right. Well, this morning we're going to uh, begin a, a look into the book of Isaiah. So if you will, I'll give you a little time to turn there. Most of your Bibles are creased open probably to Luke. So it'll be hard to, to find someplace else. But there are other books in the Bible. So we'll turn to the book of Isaiah, Old Testament. We're going to read from one of the old prophets to the, to the uh, Judeans, to the people of Judah there in, today, in uh, today's study. <clears throat> we're going to today, we're going to deal with the, the issue of, um, uh, of restoration. We want to talk today about the idea, can God restore America? Now the question is, of course God can restore America. Uh, but is there, can we be restored? And I guess is the real question today. Can we change? Can we put this nation back to a place where God can use us again? And uh, that is a question that uh, uh, we're going to have to deal with and, and, and have that question answered in our lives individually. What will it take or when will God will be too far down the road? How do we put chaos back into the box, as it were. Today we're going to be looking at the nation of Judah. The people of Judah are the uh, are led, their kings were the descendants of David, the bloodline of David. Then Solomon, you remember David, Solomon, uh, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, right on down, and we're coming now down to uh, the end of the Judean line, the end of the Judean kingship, and they're ruling in Jerusalem. Now, I'm saying this because I, for your Bible understanding, you need to realize that the nation of the Jews were divided into two nations. There was the northern tribes, ten of the northern tribes called Israel. The, the two of the southern tribes went together, and they're called Judah. Now, we're dealing with the Judeans today, the people of Judah, because the Israelites... Are, they have become almost uh, oppressed. They're almost gone. They're almost taken into the di diaspora, the dispersion. They're almost no more of them because they have been taken off into captivity and other things. For, uh, it's a complicated history, but they're not nearly as plentiful and powerful as the Judeans in Jerusalem. We're going to be dealing today with a nation that is so familiar to us because it could be easily be talking about America today when we read about what was going on in the nation of Judah at the, as they approached the end of their time. Before much longer, after we read today, not much further in history, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, they come up and they take the whole nation of Judah uh, the elite leadership, and they take them off down into captivity in Babylon. And so Isaiah is the preacher, the national preacher, uh, that he's there telling everybody uh, and warning them. He's speaking for the Lord. He's warning them about the things that are coming. You folks are having no trouble seeing through this, aren't you? And this is, okay. Uh, okay, so we're talking about Isaiah. And Isaiah is... It's preaching, telling the truth. In the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, where we'll get to in a few weeks, Isaiah has a vision. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. And in that vision, God told Isaiah about the future of the Judeans, what was going to happen to them. And God told him he was going to send them into captivity. He was going to take them from their land, take them to Babylon, and they were going to be there in captivity. And Isaiah learned all this in the vision. <clears throat> and so Isaiah then is preaching to the people. But God also told Isaiah why this was occurring. And when we get into the understanding, the rationale as to why we're being, they were being taken down into Babylon, that's where it begins to look so much like America today. And why I'm concerned, and, and you've heard me recently talk so much about how I feel like we are near the end of the American dream. I think we're close to the very end of this journey that we've been involved in here for the last couple of hundred years because things are really looking bad. And when we begin to compare 
what's to, to what's going on here in Judah, we're going to see a miracle. Well, their capital was Jerusalem. Uh, they had lost faith in God. They had began to cool off. Their, their fervency of worship had begun to wane and back out. They were replacing the worship of Jehovah God with all kinds of uh, heathen, pagan practices. They were bringing in occultism. They were bringing in all sorts of other areas and they were worshiping them. If you remember, even back in Solomon's day, this began, began in his day. And now it has progressed and it's gotten worse. And that's why I say it has looked, it looks so much like America, America today. The preachers have been preaching to these Judeans and warning them for years, decades. Have been telling them that things had to change, that things were really in trouble. But the Judeans hardened their hearts. They stiff, became stiff-necked. And they would not listen to what the prophets were saying. They would not change. Decisions had been made uh, and would go against the truth. They would go against what they knew was right. And, and that, that rebellion was beginning to permeate into every part of Judean culture. Homes, institutions. It has begun to, to rot from the inside. They were right for judgment. And that's why I feel like this is so profound to, for America today. I, I believe that the best and only hope for America today is either that we return to the Lord or the Lord returns to us. I don't think there's any other hope. Now that's pessimistic maybe. Now I hope you, I, I am by nature an optimistic person. But as I look around our world today, the truth, the reality is we, we're so far down the rabbit hole, I don't know if we can come back out of it. I know this. Our world cannot be fixed unless Jesus fixes it. That's where I believe today. So in our second chapter of Isaiah, uh, I did the introduction to the book of Isaiah last Thursday night. And so today, uh, I'll go, I'll not involve you so much in that introduction. I, I, it was, you can go back and find that on your own. But I'm going to look today in the second chapter of Isaiah through this lens. Now it's important that you that you look at the Bible through the right lens, because today we're going to be looking at this, at this through the lens of the end of a, t of a, of a nation, the, about the beginning of its captivity, and we're going to look through it because we've got to see the truth. We've got to understand the truth. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His way so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, in the world, uh, in the history, ancient world, in the ancient world, all the highest peaks up on the mountains were where they built their temples. All over it, in Athens, the, the temple to Athena. And you just look around all around the world, on the highest peaks around, you'll find the, the temples. And, there, and what Isaiah is saying, <clears throat> that the highest hill that will ever be will be Jerusalem. That will be the high place, the place where God will build His temple. Yeah. Folks, do you know that the temple, the, the, the capital of planet Earth will be Jerusalem? That's where it's going to be. Yeah, no more Washington. I mean, there will be a Washington, but that will be the capital of the Earth. No more Paris, no more London, no more uh, pick out a capital. They're all going to be the capital. The, the real capital will be in Jerusalem. And Jesus Himself, in, in flesh will sit on the throne of, of his grandfather David. He will sit on his throne there in Jerusalem. What I want to talk about now is that when the Lord returns, he's going to remove the false news or the false narrative or the, the lies that we've been told and he's going to restore perfect truth. I believe that 
almost everything we've been taught and told in our nation and about almost every category we've been lied to. There is a false narrative that has been preached and taught to us for so long that we've bought into it. We studied it in world history, even to the who discovered America. And <clears throat> I'm talking about all kinds of different things that we've been taught and told that were somebody else's narrative they wanted us bought into, but it's not the truth. There's so much lying been going on in our world. When Jesus comes, that's all going to end. Now, in this vision, Isaiah saw that, uh, uh, that the Lord was going to come back one day and restore truth. Let me take you on a short memory trip. Not too awfully long ago, we were told in our nation we had to go invade back Iraq because there was weapons of mass destruction in, in, in Baghdad. Well, what happened when we got there? We found out there were no weapons of mass destruction. And later we have found out why we invaded Iraq. Well, of course, it's oil, obviously. But the, another primary reason that was probably more important than that is that our CIA wanted the ancient artifacts in the museums in Baghdad. In those, in those museums in Baghdad were artifacts that go back before the flood of Noah. There were things there kept that our CIA wanted access to, which they're going to retrofit, turn into modern weapons or whatever. But that's the main reason we invaded Baghdad, to get those artifacts. And the, if you will let your mind go back to that memory, what was the first thing we heard about when we invaded Baghdad? Well, these teams went in and raided the museum. That's exactly the first thing that happened. Okay, that's just one little area. <coughs> We've been lied to by science. We've been lied to by medicine. Doc governments, educational institutions, and even the church has been lied to us for so long that we have, that we, we're, we're not aware of what really is going on. They're pulling the strings and we're dancing. I literally read an article last week that a columnist said that truth was dead. And boy, you know, it's almost... To the point where we say, yeah, it probably is. Truth is we're not being told the truth anymore. It's, it's gone from this earth. But when Jesus comes back, when he sets, him, sets up to his throne in Jerusalem, the truth is going to reign on planet earth. He's, what did you, how did Jesus describe himself? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No more false news. No more uh, being lied to. No more false narratives about our plan, about what's going on. The next thing I want you to notice is when Jesus returns, he's going to restore justice, perfect justice on the earth. How many of you, well, I'm going to make a statement that uh, maybe get me in trouble, but you can have justice in America if you've got enough money. You understand what I mean? If you can hire the best law, the good, good enough lawyer, you can, you'll get justice, well, or whatever you get. But... If you're a poor common folk like us uh, who can't afford million dollar lawyers, we may not always get justice here in this world. Our middle class, as I've said, is, is about gone. Uh, we've watched people lie to us about that and our wages have stagnated and our hope have sunk and uh, poverty is growing, hunger is growing in the most blessed nation on the planet. <clears throat> have you noticed that I don't want to use the Clintons' name because I would, wouldn't want to be political, but they have the worst luck in the world. A lot of people who follow them around die. You notice that? I don't understand how that works. They commit suicide. They jump off of buildings. And, and it's horrible to think that they're friends. I wouldn't want to be their friend with you. Well, how do people get away with that kind of stuff? Okay, so is there justice? No, not really. Now, at this moment in our capital city is the most scandalous um, thing going on in the history of the world. It's very similar to the days of Rome when Nero and those horrible Roman rulers led. That's going on in America today in our capital and it goes like pedophilia. Somehow there is this huge ring of elite leadership in America that are engaged in, in this, this sex trafficking ring 
and we're of underage children. And I, I suppose that in what I'm reading is that it's worse than anything we could ever imagine how big it is and how large it is. I have I've heard some commentators say that as many as a third of our elite leadership in government are involved in this. How can a nation survive that is so rotten from the inside? I'm going to just make us. I'm going to say, be careful and watch the watch what happens this summer because there's going to be a whole lot of them brought to justice. I've been hearing there's a lot of people moving toward bringing this to justice. We're going to hear some names we never dreamed of that are going to be caught up in this. Well, there's a lot going on, scandals and and and, and injustice. But one day God's going to return and fix it. <clears throat> now I want you to come with me in your mind for a little bit and just think. For 6,000 years, we've been on planet Earth since Adam and Eve, and, and the Bible tells us about 6,000 years have passed. And for that entire 6,000 years, we have focused the attention of, uh, our best attention, on building weapons of war. We have invested trillions of dollars into weapons of war. We, when we could have been curing diseases, we could have been feeding the poor, building homes for, for the uh, under-housed. We could, we could have been taking care of people and making this almost heaven on earth. But for those many years, we have just given our best minds, our best people, our, be our most money to weapons of war and those sorts of things. But when Jesus comes back, we're going to be able to focus entirely on the positive no more weapons of war. No more uh, negative thoughts and dreams. We're going to be focusing on the good things. Let's read the continue reading in verse 4. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. My friends, can you imagine where our world would be today if we hadn't focused on all, all that negative stuff for 6,000 years. I believe if we could have not sinned in the garden and have stayed positive and had not been influenced by fallen angels, that we would be all over the universe, and, and especially our solar system, and we'd have cured diseases, and we would make life wonderful instead of the mess we've created. Now let's move to verse 6. Now, look, I want to tell you this morning, and I've, I've rendered this frustration all morning as I've been preaching this sermon, is that there, I would like to go back and spend about another year coming back through Isaiah 1 and 2. There is that much in there for us to study. I'm frustrated because I can't even hardly scratch the surface of what I'm discovering and what we need to learn from Isaiah. So trust me that I would like to dig deeper. I just don't, we don't have the time. But you can go back and do that study. Go back in and, and look into this and try to figure out what God may be saying to us. Now, in verse 6, we're going to find another category of things he's going to fix when he comes back. And this is, he's going to completely end all worthless religion. He's going to end it. It will be no more when the Lord comes back. Let's read verse 6. You, Lord, have abandoned your people, the, the descendants of Jacob. They're full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and embrace pagan customs. Well, one of the lies that we've been told and, and, and one of the stories that we've not been told is how involved our, our dark nature is on earth, how involved that is in fallen angel knowledge. When the, when the fallen angels came to planet earth, they began to instruct early man in vile arts, in evil, in warcraft. They taught us, they began to teach us how to make weapons. They began to teach us how to do incantations and rituals and riots, rites to engage supernatural forces in our world and how to cause things to happen. They they, they moved into destroying families because they taught, they taught us how to be, to be seductive, how to 
how to be unfaithful in our marriages. Now, one of the things that I get a kick out of when I think about this is they, they taught us how to do makeup and, and how to fix up our, our women's bodies so they'd be beautiful to look at. Now, ladies, you're beautiful. I, I believe that. I really are. But you know, any old barn, it looks better with paint on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You understand what I mean? I mean, lovingly. You, you're beautiful ladies. But I'm not against makeup. But these, these fallen beings, if you read Genesis very carefully, that's one of the things they taught us, is how to be seductive and how to move into these areas to destroy our families, how to be unfaithful to our husband. They taught us how to make war. They taught us secrets that were too advanced for us at, at that time. They moved us too quickly. Now, God did not want to keep us in the dark and dumb and stupid. He had plans for us. But he, he knew that we would grow and mature gradually. We learn techniques and things, metallurgy and, and other things that way, all as we move through time. He knew that. But when those angels, fall angels came, they began to teach mankind these occult, hidden, esoteric truths. And it got us into huge trouble. Now, what's going to happen when the Lord comes back? I wouldn't want to be a fallen angel. And I wouldn't want to be somebody that follows them. The, un, the redeemed. The unredeemed. Now you say, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, if you're a sinner and you've not trusted Jesus, let me tell you something. You're still following this fallen nature. You're, you're following things you don't want to be dealing with. And so I'm just cautioning you there. Let, let me read you just a few things. Verse 7. Their land is full of silver and gold. And there's no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There's no end to their chariots. Verse 8. Their land is full of idols. They may bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So people will be brought low and everyone humble. And then Isaiah says, do not forgive them. Now the result of the fallen knowledge, as I said, produced a lot of treasure, but not for mankind. It, but it was not for us. We develop as too fast and, and, and learn too many things that we should not have. And it brought us low and it has destroyed us. But just imagine... If those 6,000 years, we could have focused on the positive and the, and the uplifting. Now, this next verse, is when we read in 10 through 18, is the cautions that the Lord gave to Isaiah to tell those fallen, unredeemed people and the fallen angels. He said to them, in verse 10, Go into the rocks, hide in the ground, from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty. The eyes of the arrogant will be humble. The human pride brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humble. The reason I stop here is because I want to, I want to open that up just a little bit for you. He's talk, talking to these fallen ones that were so arrogant. And if you read... Uh, we're in Isaiah and in other places where, where the Lucifer wanted to be like God. He said, I will be like the Most High. I will, I will climb the, the hills of the north. And I'll, well, they're, they're, they're arrogance is what he's talking about here. And it, that came to us too. Verse 15 continues to describe them. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humble. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols will totally disappear. When Jesus comes back, it's going to be a bad day for all the fallen, for those that don't follow Him, for those that are in rebellion to Him. Now today, when I preach from this, and I use these code words that we're finding in here. There's so much coded language here that we modern humans, we don't get. When it talks about the, the cedars of Lebanon, the, the, uh, the trees of Bashan or whatever, we're, we're talking about this monstrosities that were created that time. And, and uh, again, if I had an hour, an hour, and a, two hours, I could dig into some of this. But trust me, the people who read this in Isaiah's day, they understood it exactly. They knew exactly what Isaiah was talking about. They got all the references. But we have not kept that 
in, in Christian teaching you know, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. When I was in seminary, this was never discussed, was never talked about. Uh, whenever we get to a point like this when we were studying in, in, the, in, in seminary, we would we come this, and the professors would just scoot right over and just, you know, go fast. I did the same thing. When I preached around for years, I wouldn't dig into this. But I asked about 10 years ago, I said, Lord, would you open my eyes? I, I want to see what you're doing. I want to understand your truth. And sometimes I wish I hadn't prayed that prayer. But the Lord is opening my eyes and showing me now exactly what, not exactly, but showing me all I can stand in heaven. Now, I want to continue and close the sermon today by reading verse 19 through 21. Because when the Lord comes back, all those who are in rebellion to Him, humans, whatever, there's going to be no place for them to hide. Have you heard of deep underground military uh, bases? Uh, Cheyenne Mountain and other places. Apparently there are all kinds of, of these deep, they call them dumbs, deep underground military bases. There are all these all over America. They, they, and the continuity of government, our government spends billions of dollars. It's called continuity of government. But the truth is, it's underground bunkers for the elite and the rich and the leaders to get into if we have a nuclear war or whatever. They're all ready for that. Are you what they're saying? And us people here in, on top, on the surface, we're just kind of on our own. But the point is, this next verse, it, it speaks to those people who think they're going to escape by being preppers or having doomsday bunkers or whatever. It's not going to work. Let's read it. People will flee to the caves in the rocks, to the holes in the ground, from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He rises to shake the earth. And in that day, people will throw away to the moles and bats their idols of silver and gold and, and from which they worship. Let me ask you a question. Where do bats live? In dark caves. Where, where do moles live? In my yard, but where else? Do, do they live underground? Uh, it says, in those days, the people are going to throw their gold and their idols, just throw them away. Throw them into the deep underground bunkers and to the moles and the bats. Why? Because they're not going to do them any good. When the Lord shakes the earth, you can't get in a deep underground bunker and be safe for Him. They'll cry to the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them when the Lord comes and says. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. They will flee to the caverns and the rocks and the overhanging crags from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He arises to shake the earth. Oh my goodness. When Jesus comes back, you better know Him. You better have your trust in Him. You need to be built on the solid rock, not on a doomsday bunker or an underground, or, or have your in wealth or in gold or silver. Now that's what matters. Trust in the Lord. Build upon the rock. And now in verse 22, we close this sermon this morning with these words. And before I read it, I want to tell you, I don't think it matters who's the President of the United States. I don't think it matters who's our government, our leaders, our congressmen, our senators. I don't think it matters. I think it's important, of course. But the Lord teaches us here, stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? Why look up to those people? Why do we trust in them? Because they're not going to help us in this day that's coming. Nothing will help us in the day except knowing the Lord. So why would you trust someone else? Why trust science? Why trust medicine? Why trust anything and not the Lord? Lean on Him and, and trust Him. And He will take care of His children. Today, as we close this sermon and this message, I want to say to those of you who know the Lord, rejoice. Rejoice. If you know the Lord, be thankful. But if you don't know Him, and if you were a sinner and you're in rebellion to Him, this would be the best time I could ever imagine for you to change and come to Him. Lay down your arrogance, your pride, your ego. Stop rebelling and come and follow Jesus. This is the day for that. Number 24, He touched me. <laughs>